in the state forest and also identification. Um, but it was kind of fun to dig a little bit deeper and go down a few rabbit holes. So I'm going to share some of what I found with you all tonight, some of the parts of the story of our state flower that I think are most interesting. So we're going to kind of go through first how to identify mountain laurel and talk about some other species that look like it. Uh, talk about the ecology and the role that mountain laurel plays in the state forests. Uh, uh, throughout Pennsylvania, uh, where to find it, how to grow it, and some of the cultural and historical significances of the plant. So I think the first thing we should do is talk about how it got its name. So as many of you probably know, the scientific name for Mount Laurel is Calmia latifolia. So let's, let's dig into this. So it is in the genus Calmia. It got that name from this gentleman. This is uh, Pierre Calm. He was a finished Finnish botanist and explorer. Uh, he first arrived in the colonies uh, in the Port of Philadelphia in 1748. Uh, as with many uh, European scientists that came to the New World, he was quickly befriended by Ben Franklin and John Bartram, who was a renowned botanist ready by the 1740s. His home base was more or less the Philadelphia area, which was the home base for most folks coming to the colonies at that time, uh, as well as uh, New Jersey, where Swedesboro, New Jersey is now. There was a large group of Swedish settlers that he sort of piled around with. Uh, this gentleman traveled as far west as Niagara Falls and as far north as Ontario. Uh, mostly, he was looking for mulberry tree specimens to take back to try to start a silk industry uh, back in Finland and Sweden. Well, while he was doing that, he was also taking very copious notes about culture and natural um, conditions in the colonies uh, and published a, a great many journals when he returned to Europe. Uh, he was trained by Linnaeus, who some of you probably know, helped to develop the modern scientific uh, naming system, the taxonomy that we use still today. Uh, and as such, when he began sending specimens back to his teacher, Linnaeus, uh, one of the spe specimens he sent back was Mount Laurel. And it didn't have a genus yet, so it, the genus Calmia was named after him. So the year that he first described Mount Laurel is 1748, and uh, that, that year will become significant here in a moment. Um, and one of the things that he referred to it as was spoon tree, uh, and he said that it's never grown, it grows to a great height. It was never grown to a great height, but it was kind of shrubby and found in a lot of places. Uh, and it was named spoon tree because the Native Americans used it for spoons and trowels. He also went on to, to say that it didn't really have much of a smell. You know, Europeans at the time were very interested in horticultural species, particularly ones that were very uh, aromatic, uh, very showy. Uh, but he did feel that the flowers warranted sending some of the material back to Europe. So what about the latifolia part? Well, this is a little bit more straightforward. Uh, latifolia in Latin means having wide leaves. Uh, versus on the right, angustifolia, which means having narrow leaves. So these are two different species in the Calmia genus, our Mount Laurel on the left and Sheep Laurel on the right. And we'll get back to Sheep Laurel a little bit later, but the latifolia refers to the fact that in the Mount Laurel, the leaves are wider than in the, uh, the close relative of the Sheep Laurel. So there's our Calmia latifolia. But getting back to that 1748 and pure calm, it turns out, as I started reading about this, that he wasn't the first person, the first European to describe Mount Laurel. Uh, and actually, another explorer who was here in 1726, when things were really the frontier, uh, found this plant. He called it ground laurel or Camadaphne folius. Uh, I did want to put this quote in that I found from him uh, that I think is pretty cool because he, he really was struck by this plant. That's his botanical drawing on the left, and he really thought it was a beautiful plant, the flower and the shrub. Uh, and if you search for this Mark Catsby uh, gentleman, 
he actually drew a tremendous amount of both plants and wildlife uh, as he was traveling through uh, the new colonies. So I thought maybe that that was the first European that described it. But then I also found that in 1624, John Smith uh, from Jamestown and from Pocahontas, all those things, he actually mentions Mount Laurel in his general history of Virginia, which was sent back uh, after his initial trip. Though he doesn't really go on to describe it scientifically, you know, he was more of a military leader, an explorer, not really a scientist. So, so really, as far back as the first colony, we have Europeans who are describing Mount Laurel, calling it abundant, talking about its uses from Native Americans. So then I began to think about, like, why do we call it Mount Laurel? Why is that the sort of preferred common name for it? And I think for all of us who travel throughout the state, uh, it's very clear that the mountain part is signified by where it grows. And we'll kind of delve deeper into this in a little bit too, but when I think of Mount Laurel, I think of, of scenes like this in North Central PA, where the Mount Laurel is growing at the ridge top or the mountain top uh, in kind of open conditions um, or on rocky slopes. So I think the mountain part is, is sort of well named. Uh, when it comes to the laurel, I suspect from what I read that this comes from uh, its resemblance to bay laurel or true laurel. So this is the plant where we get bay leaves from. Uh, not in the same genus, but somewhat similar, certainly similar in the way it looks. And a lot of times with the uh, European settlers and early scientists, when they began trying to put down common names in particular for plants, they either went with what the Native Americans called it, uh, if they could pronounce it or spell it, or what early colonists maybe called it. Uh, I think in this case, it looked a lot like laurel, a plant that they knew from Europe, that they knew from Greek history, uh, and that's where the laurel moniker comes from. And this bay laurel, not our mountain laurel, is where the, the turn of phrase resting on your laurels comes from, because these bay laurels were made into wreaths in ancient Greece, and were given as prizes to athletes who won competitions. So they wore the wreath, but if they rested on it, they sat on it, then they were kind of taking it easy or they weren't gonna to try to win again. So that's where the resting on the laurels comes from, unfortunately, uh, not from our mountain laurel. It does have a lot of other common names. And you know, depending on how much you know about plants, um, you may know that common names, uh, especially for plants that grow throughout either the north and the south uh, of the east coast or both east and west in the United States, they tend to have a lot of common names depending on the region you're from. And mountain laurel is no different. Uh, some people call it ivy bush or mountain ivy. Um, this could be, you know, folks who aren't familiar with plants. You know, English ivy is evergreen, kind of leathery dark green leaves. Mountain laurel is too. So I'm guessing that that's sort of where the ivy comes from. Again, uh, European settlers who may not have been very familiar with plants recognized that it had dark green evergreen leaves, so they just called it an ivy, and the names were stuck at the time. Um, another name for it is spoonwood, and again, this goes back to our friend Pierre Calm, who noted right away that it was used by the Native Americans for carving implements. Uh, so there's a mountain laurel spoon that I found online, and also pipes, tobacco pipes, that are carved from the burls of the mountain laurel. And you can search around on the internet and find some folks who still carve uh, from mountain laurel today. Another name that's pretty prevalent is calico bush. And uh, we'll talk more about the flowers as well, but you can certainly see that that sort of calico, uh, white to pink appearance uh, is definitely uh, a well-chosen name uh, for this species as well. And finally, uh, lamb kill is another one that comes up a lot. And again, we have our friend Pierre Calm to thank for that. Um, in some of his initial trips west from Philadelphia, you know, these, these folks that would travel across the frontier would often take livestock with them, um, either to stay and kind of produce a settlement of sorts or a kind of way station or just to eat. And one of the things he wrote early in his journal was that the sheep that they took with them uh, ate the mountain laurel along the trails and died. 
So I think that's where the, the lamb kill stuck. And certainly there's probably a lot of other frontier farmers uh, who recognized very early that their livestock shouldn't be eating the mountain. Mountain laurel is in the family Ericaceae. So this is the heath family. Uh, there's a lot of other familiar sort of common shrub species that are in this family, including uh, from left to right, uh, top to bottom, you've got azaleas, rhododendrons, cranberries, tea berry, uh, black huckleberry, and blueberry, all of which grow on similar sites, uh, acid soils with the exception of cranberry, which grows in the bogs. Uh, in Pennsylvania. So let's kind of transition now to how to identify it. So if this is the first time that you've really spent any time with Mount Laurel, uh, this may be really helpful for some of you all. It's probably review, but I think it's important to go through all these characteristics. Uh, Mount Laurel, as I mentioned, uh, is an evergreen shrub. It has alternate leaves, and in the plant world, one of the first distinctions we want to make is whether the leaves are Opposite, meaning they come off of the stem in the same spot. Alternate, that they alternate uh, one side then the other, moving up a stem, uh, or in some cases, whirled, where they all come out from the same point and form sort of a circle around the stem. So with mountain laurel, it has alternate leaves. They sometimes appear whirled, but as you kind of get down in there, uh, they're typically alternate. And this plant can range anywhere from a foot, two foot, three foot, up to, I've seen some very tall, know, 20, maybe 25 down south in some wetter spots uh, plants. Uh, and certainly some of the older specimens that are planted in botanical gardens, especially around Philadelphia, uh, are quite large and quite old. When we zoom into the stems of mountain laurel, I always uh, have this picture uh, in my mind. Mountain laurel tends to lose a lot of its lower leaves as it ages. It self prunes just like a conifer tree would uh, since they're growing a lot in the shade. So you get this sort of webbed network of varying stems coming out from a central root, uh, different uh, diameters. Some are still alive, some are dead. They don't come out straight all the time. They kind of go up and then curve. So you get this tangled web underneath the foliage. Uh, of the plant. And it tends to have sort of a ragged or shredded look to the bark. Uh, it can be anywhere from sort of an ashy gray to a red or brown. Uh, there's a lot of variation there and it depends a lot on where, where it's growing. Here's a close-up shot of the bark uh, on a mature stem. It reminds me a little bit of a grapevine if you're familiar with grapevines. Uh, but this tends to be, a, the mountain laurel tends to be a little bit more of a gray, whereas like a grapevine would be more of that kind of a brownish chestnut. When we look at the leaves, uh, they're evergreen, as I mentioned, so they're going to stay on the plant even through the winter, although the, the plant will slowly recycle leaves uh, after a two or three year period. The leaves are alternate, as I mentioned, they're glossy, uh, they're leathery, tend to feel kind of thick. Uh, they're dark green on top and a lighter green on the underside. And the reason I put this picture up is because this is a lot of times what you're going to see in the early spring or on a plant that's just vegetative and isn't going to flower. You're going to see that new growth is going to be a brighter green color. And then as you get to some of the older leaves, they kind of go from that lime green to a dark green to like a greenish brownish black as they start to mature and desiccate and fall off over time. <laughs> The leaves are anywhere from two to four inches long or so. Um, they're oblong or what a botanist might call lanceolate uh, or oblong lanceolate, meaning they're long and they taper, but they're a little bit wide in the middle. So, you know, a lanceolate leaf would be like a willow. This is more like an oblong lanceolate shape. Uh, they have smooth margins and that's gonna become important as we talk about some of the lookalikes. There's no teeth along the margin of this leaf and there's no hairs on the underside of the leaves. One of the characteristic things that I notice a lot in the fall and winter months is the leaves, the evergreen leaves tend to droop in the winter. This is uh, to help shed snow and ice and also to avoid full sun exposure. A lot of times the mountain laurel is growing under the canopy of trees. So it's synthesizing in sort of a doppled light or a partial sun, partial sage situation. The leaves fall off the overstory trees, 
uh, it can change the rate of photosynthesis. And sometimes the leaves aren't adapted for that. So in the case of Mount Moral, it changes the angle of the sunshine by dripping the leaves. And it also, as I mentioned, sheds a lot of snow and ice in the mountains. I like this picture too, because it, it demonstrates the old growth versus the newer growth. So on a healthy mountain laurel plant, you'll often find this light green growth near the tips. And that's probably either the, that year or the just previous year's growth. Uh, this tends to be sticky. It tends to have lots of little hairs, which you can sort of see in this picture. Uh, and this is a picture I'm guessing that was taken in early spring, just as the weather was warming. So you've got a flower head just beginning to form here at the top of this branch. So let's talk about the flowers. This is the part that most people recognize when they think about Mount Laurel. Uh, they're clustered at the ends of the branchlets. They're about, you know, an inch, inch and a half wide, 15 to 30 millimeters in the guidebooks. They vary a lot in color, anywhere from a really uh, stark white to a light pink, almost to like a, a reddish pink. As we zoom in, one of the things that's unique uh, despite the color of the, the larger part of the petals, there's always this variegation. You know, remember that calico bush moniker? It's going to have the variegation down near the base of the flower, near the ovary, and then also up near the tops of the petals, about halfway up the flower. And another thing that's pretty characteristic about this plant is the, the flower buds that haven't opened yet, which you'll see at the top of the picture, kind of look like a star or like a uh, dot of icing that you might squeeze out of a piping bag. Uh, and these flowers we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about, because this is probably, at least in terms of the botanical characteristic, one of the coolest things about Mount Laurel. So you'll notice these flowers, as I've written, have the ovary right here. So that's the female part of the flower. They also have these 10 stamen filaments that go out around the flower and the stigma is there in the center. Now these filaments are actually not resting against this petal, but they're in a little pocket. And as these flower buds begin to swell and they open, the top of the flower, the tops of the petals starts to pull, starts to pull away, and it actually increases the amount of tension on these filaments that are going from the ovary up to the edge of the petal. And actually, one thing I forgot to mention, uh, that I don't want to forget to say is this pentagonal shape, the sort of almost five-sided look that these flowers have and the, the petals that are fused together, they're not uniquely petaled. Uh, that's a pretty good characteristic too. But anyway, these, these filaments, once this flower is fully open, are under significant uh, strain. But this little lip right here holds them in place. I wanted to show a video here, so you'll have to bear with me. The video, oh, it's working now. Great. So keep an eye out right here as this bumblebee is rummaging around to try to get some nectar out of this flower. He's actually going to trip these filaments and they're going to fling up into him. So watch right here and you'll see the filament move. There it went, right there. And it caught him right on the underside. So this is really a unique characteristic for this plant. So these filaments are sort of just like high tensile line and they're ready to go waiting for some sort of vibration or, or something to knock them loose. And initially, some folks thought that Mount Laurel was wind pollinated because the wind, a strong wind might jostle the flowers and release the filaments. But as you can see, this is really where the bumblebees uh, come in handy. Now, a little bit forward in time, we have a lot more technology, a lot more scientific minds at work on some of these uh, projects. And this is a, a video that came out of Harvard not too long ago. Watch what happens when they trip one of these filaments. There you can see the pollen sacs flying out of the flower. And one of the things that the article uh, said was that Mount Laurel was the fastest plant on earth because they measured the speed of that shooting pollen at eight miles an hour. So take that for what you will. Uh, I'll play it again just so you can see it. They're gonna trip it 
And there go the pollen sacs. What's really interesting is that uh, this scientist and forester, his name is Joseph Rothrock, who happens to be the father of forestry in Pennsylvania, actually did a lot of work on this plant and other plants that were other pollinating species in 1867. And he noted that these stamens were like a spring just ready to fly uh, when let loose. And he talks about the pollen is often carried by the force of the spring to the pistil of an adjacent flower. So again, when he observed this, he thought much like other folks that this pollen was getting shot out of one flower and was getting kind of hopefully landing in another flower. Plus, when you take a look at the form of mountain laurel, it sort of makes sense to come to that conclusion because the flowers are so grouped together at the top of the plant that they're sort of just shooting pollen from one to another. So this was sort of one of those theories that was just kind of percolating in the botanical community for a very long time. That, yeah, the bees came in and sometimes they disrupt filaments, but that's not really the way the plant wants to be pollinated. Well, back to our researchers at Harvard, and they actually found by doing a lot of pollination tests where they simulate uh, bees releasing the filaments and also the filaments releasing into other flowers, uh, they feel, and I quoted them here so, so that we could get it straight, uh, they think that the pollinators are sort of rare, that there's not a lot of nectar in these flowers, the nectar and the pollen are toxic to many things, uh, that they feel that the filaments catapulting the pollen into the other insects. So, you know, in a lot of flowers, uh, bees, butterflies, they just brush up against some of the pollen and move it to the next one. Whereas mountain laurel, they feel, explodes that filament so it definitely sticks to the bee. And they feel like that kind of adhesion by force, so to speak, uh, helps pollen get from one flower to another by the bumblebee and that throwing it, as Dr. Rothrock thought, to the next flower is less successful. So, you know, as is often the case in the botanical community, anytime you have a unique adaptation, uh, it's subject to a lot of theories and speculation and conflicting hypotheses. Uh, but right now, as of 2018, science seems to indicate that the explosive filaments are to definitely adhere it to insects that can carry it way further than just the adjacent flower. So that was a bit of an aside on the flowers. Back to our identification, uh, one other slide I have here. This is what the fruit capsules look like. So you'll remember that the ovary was at the bottom of the flower cup. So if that ovary is pollinated, it's gonna swell and the seed is within this fruit. So in late summer, early fall, this is typically what you'll see, just the fruit capsules, the seeds remaining at the top of the plant, and all the flowers desiccated. There are some other species that resemble mountain laurel. Uh, probably the one that I find gets confused with mountain laurel the most often is rhododendron maximum, uh, great rhododendron, rose bay. Uh, I always learn just to call it rhododendron. Um, but to the keen eye, you can see that there are some differences. So the flowers are a little bit different. You can see they're larger. They have very well-defined petals. They don't have that fused pentagonal shape that our mountain laurel does. Uh, you can see that it has a yellow coloration to attract pollinators on the inside rather than the pink variegation. The leaves are a lot larger. They're longer. They tend to droop the whole way down uh, and curl in the winter. And probably the, the best way to look is to take one of the leaves, flip it over to the underside. If it has small hairs on the underside of the leaf, it's most likely rhododendron. And you'll recall that a mountain laurel leaf does not have any hairs on the underside. Uh, so rhododendron, larger, bigger blooms, well-defined petals, uh, and hair on the undersides of the leaves. And unfortunately, rhododendron and mountain laurel do tend to grow in the same places. So you just want to keep your eye out uh, to make sure that you're looking at the right one. Uh, another species that resembles mountain laurel is wild azalea. Other people call it pink flower. Uh, and this will come up a little bit later in our talk again. Um, 
but you can see that when you have the flowers, they're very clearly different than the mountain laurel. They have a very long, dark pink corolla tube and these protruding stamens that stick way out beyond the petals. You know, very different than our kind of tight, pentagonal shaped, fused petal flower um, with crazy spring loaded filaments. On a pinkster flower, an azalea, the leaves tend to have these fine hairs on the margin, which you recall is not what we see in our mountain laurel. Uh, the hairs are also typically along the midrib of the leaf, which is the center vein right here. One other species I'll mention is the Calmia angustifolia. Remember, this means narrow leafed Calmia. So, this is what we usually call sheep laurel. This one does look a little bit more like mountain laurel than some of the others, especially in the flower. And you can see it's very similar, except for those narrow leaves, you know, maybe half as wide as a mountain laurel. These plants tend to be a lot smaller too, uh, maybe only a few feet tall. And uh, probably what's gonna be the giveaway is the habitat. If you're looking at sheep laurel, you're probably in some sort of a wetland uh, up in the Poconos or a wet edge. Um, you know, not the dry, rocky, sort of mid-slope habitat where you might find on Mount Laurel. So where can you find our uh, state flower? Well, pretty much from Maine the whole way to Louisiana and across the Appalachians uh, is the Mount Laurel's range. Here in this map, uh, the yellow counties are places where it's a state listed plant, so it's threatened or endangered in Florida, Louisiana, uh, and Maine, but everywhere else pretty common. Uh, in Pennsylvania, I tend to find mountain laurel on a variety of habitats, but if I had to sort of describe what mountain laurel likes, uh, I think it likes dry to maybe slightly moist soils, definitely with uh, acidic pHs. Um, it tolerates open sun, like in this picture, just fine, but I think it really prefers sort of a mid-level, mid sort of like partially shaded under the uh, forest overstory. It tends to do pretty well. Um, it can grow on a forest edge, a uh, roadside, on electric or pipeline rights of way. Uh, I see it a lot, so it seems to, to appreciate the extra light on those edges. Um, typically though, an historic habitat would be more like a ridge top, uh, an exposed slope, um, a rocky sort of mid slope position and maybe like an oak forest, uh, and certainly like higher elevations. You know, if you're here where a lot of us probably are in the greater Harrisburg area, you kind of need to get sort of upslope a little bit before the mountain laurel starts to peek in uh, on the mountainsides around here, but uh, it is quite common. This is a, a map of places where botanical specimens have been collected from mountain laurel and, and stashed away either in Philadelphia or Pittsburgh. So you can see that it's got uh, pretty much every county covered. There's a few counties there in Western PA uh, that don't have collections, but I suspect if you looked hard enough, you could find it in every county in the state. So kind of getting back to the locations, um, places where I would recommend going to see Mount Laurel. Uh, the first one that comes to mind is places in the Ridge and Valley, the central mountains of our state. Uh, I grew up in Huntington County, so Rothrock State Forest was my backyard. And these kinds of shots were quite common in late May through June. Uh, Mount Laurel, very uh, dense in the mid-story of a acidic, rocky, chestnut oak forest. You know, so when I talk uh, Ridge and Valley, I'm talking places like the Blue Arrows, which are state forests, uh, Tuscarora, Rothrock, Bald Eagle. Uh, another good place around here with the Red Arrow is South Mountain. That would be the Michaud State Forest just outside of Carlisle and Shippensburg. You know, that's not uh, the typical sort of ridge top, so to speak, but South Mountain does have some higher elevation spots, definitely some dry acidic soils in places. Another thought that I that comes to mind when I think about mountain laurel habitat are places in north central Pennsylvania, uh, places in the Allegheny Plateau where you have sort of these uh, mountaintops and vistas, these kind of open 
shrubby, dry uh, habitats where you get tons of mountain laurel uh, through the early summer. So these would be any of the places up in north central Pennsylvania, Sproul, Moshannon, Tidotten, Susquehannock, Tioga, Loyal Sox State Forests, um, and all the state parks in those areas, great places to find mountain laurel. And while we have the map up, talking about timing, you know, when, when should we go look for mountain laurel? Well, I've seen it in the Michaux State Forest, which again is South Mountain right here, uh, from late May through early June. So it kind of starts in, in late May down here in Southern Pennsylvania. As you work your way north, you know, you might find it here in Huntington County, uh, first and second week of June, probably get away with late June up here in the northern part of the state. So you really have about a month, I would say, from south to north, from kind of mid to late May through June, depending on the weather. If you're feeling less intrepid, another place that I would recommend going to check out Mountain Laurel is Jenkins Arboretum. It's in Devon, PA, which is southeast Pennsylvania. Uh, this particular arboretum actually specializes in species that are in the Ericaceae family. So they have uh, a giant collection of different types of calmias, uh, also rhododendrons and azaleas. There's a little bit of a mix of everything in this photograph. Um, and these would be a lot of cultivars, cultivated variations that have been grown by horticulturalists of these plants. But there's a living collection, so these plants are all alive, growing in what would be a standard habitat for these species. And you can sort of peruse and, and walk through the garden and the arboretum and see these things when they're all in bloom. So uh, I would highly recommend checking out that spot as well. So let's shift a little bit and talk about the ecology. So what does Mount Laurel do in our forest ecosystems? Um, well, it, as we mentioned, it does provide a nectar resource for pollinators. All parts of this plant are toxic, which I'll touch on in a bit. Um, so it's not ideal nectar. And also, depending on what source you read, some sources indicate that there's not very much nectar in each Mount Laurel flower. But when you think about a mature oak forest uh, in early June, there's not gonna be a tremendous amount of flowers to pollinate or to get nectar from just yet. Mountain laurel sort of fills a, an important gap. You've got trees that are gonna bloom very early in the spring, like red maple, and then you're gonna move kind of to some of the other oaks and other species. But in the meantime, you sort of need something to get pollinators by and mountain laurel tends to be it. So even if there's not much nectar, there's so many flowers that a pollinating species could collect quite a bit. So that's one important role. And I tried to look online and find some scientific literature for specific species. Um, I couldn't find a lot, but these were a few examples of species that, that are known in Pennsylvania to nectar uh, on mountain laurel flowers. Uh, the laurel sphinx moss is a specialist on some of the ericaceous species. Uh, and of course, uh, our native bumblebees are really going to be important uh, in terms of the ecology of this plant because of those explosive filaments we talked about earlier. And one of the things I read about those filaments was these butterflies and moths that nectar on the mountain laurel tend to rest on the edges of the flower towards the top and may not even trigger those filaments. Um, because they have a proboscis, they can get down in the flower, they don't really have to rumble around in there like a bumblebee does. Uh, some hummingbirds have been known to nectar on mountain laurel. Uh, other birds predate insects or insect eggs that are laid in mountain laurel. Uh, and then there are some seed-eating songbirds that will eat the seeds if they're hard up in fall or winter. For mammals and uh, wintering birds, uh, mountain laurel provides really good thermal cover, just like a conifer stand would. Because of the evergreen leaves and the dense growth that you sometimes have in mountain laurel, it can be really important uh, as thermal habitat in the wintertime. And thinking about those thickets, um, one of the things I came across while I was reading is uh, maybe down south or historically, these thickets of mountain laurel uh, were referred to as hells or referred to as slicks. Um, I've only ever known them as thickets of laurel, um, but the feeling is the same. And I found this quote uh, on one of the sites and I wanted to share it. Um, 
because I think it's completely true. Anyone who's tried to walk through a stand of Mount Laurel knows it's faster to walk the half mile around it than the tenth of a mile through it. And, and I hope some of you out there have tried to bushwhack through Mount Laurel like I have. Uh, boy, is it ever tough. And the network of living and dead um, stems from the lower part of the plants tend to intertwine with the adjacent plants. And it is really a bear to try to get through there. If you're lucky enough to find a deer trail, you can make headway for a while, and then all of a sudden you're surrounded by Mount Laurel, and you're trying to walk on top of it, or you start on your hands and knees, and then you end up on your stomach, and it's just a mess. So I, I agree with the sentiment that it's always faster to walk around it, and certainly when I'm out with the foresters, we just all sort of gravitate to the edges of these Mount Laurel thickets and try to work around them, above them, below them, instead of through them. Uh, and one of the things I think about when I think of these Mount Laurel thickets is places like the Sproul State Forest in north central Pennsylvania and inevitably in these Mount Laurel thickets where you can't see the ground, you end up finding these friends, uh, timber rattlesnakes. You know, they like that same sort of rocky, dry ridge top or mountainside habitat. Um, so keep an eye out for rattlesnakes if you're going through any of these Mount Laurel thickets. And you know, I think the thickets are partially because this plant tends to reproduce from the root system and from rhizomes more so than from seed. So you get these kind of thick growth patterns as they spread out vegetatively. And also too, uh, as those fruits open, if you are gonna get seed germination, those seeds are gonna fall sort of right to the ground. So it tends to just grow right where the mature plant is. <laughs> The foresters that I work with aren't big fans of Mount Laurel. I mean, they like them because they're Pennsylvanians and it's our state flower and it's pretty in June, but uh, they can really provide a lot of interference with tree regeneration, and uh, especially in a young forest uh, or a forest that's been cut and is regenerating. Mount Laurel tends to grow in thickets. It tends to not really be disturbed by uh, the canopy being taken off of a stand. And you end up with really uh, these dense shaded areas where not a lot of new tree regeneration can grow. And I've also read that the leaf litter, the, the old leaves falling off, tend to uh, make the soil inhospitable for some tree species that need a little bit more of a nutrient-rich soil to get started. Uh, studies have shown that over the past 100 years, mountain laurel density has increased in a lot of our eastern forests. Uh, there's a couple theories as to why that might be. One is uh, gypsy moth defoliation in the 80s and 90s created a lot of canopy gaps. Uh, Mount Laurel may have been able to take advantage of those gaps, especially since probably a lot of the oak seedlings in the understory were eaten as well as the canopy trees by the gypsy moth caterpillars. Uh, also, another theory is that when the chestnut blight came through and killed a lot of the chestnuts uh, that were the mature, dominant trees in our eastern forests uh, created the same canopy gaps that Mount Laurel was able to take advantage of. And another theory is that deer have eaten everything that they like to munch on in the forest, trees and plants alike. They don't eat a lot of Mount Laurel uh, and as such the plants that they don't eat as much of tend to do better. And In this case that would be Mount Laurel in a lot of places. And, and thinking about deer and herbivory, it's kind of a unique story too. Uh, deer will browse Mount Laurel as a last resort if there's nothing else to eat. Uh, also, uh, deer tend to eat the new growth on Mount Laurel or new seedlings and not the older leaves. And these leaves uh, are toxic to livestock and people. Uh, they contain glycosides. Uh, asbiotoxin is the particular chemical that's toxic in Mount Laurel. Uh, and one thought is that deer are actually self-medicating, that they, they somehow have developed a sense for how much they can consume before it makes them sick, um, or that there's some sort of medicinal benefit to eating a little bit of this chemical, but not very much. Uh, another thing that I think is interesting is uh, when prescribed fire took off as a management technique in Pennsylvania 
you know, a decade or, or so ago. Uh, the thought from some of these foresters that I work with and that have, have come before us was that perhaps a prescribed fire that burned the mountain laurel would help uh, rejuvenate the forest, provide opportunities for new seedlings to grow. Uh, and it may be cheaper than trying to, to cut all the mountain laurel out of the understory. Uh, good theory, and it was tried, and a lot of studies have shown that mountain laurel tends to re-sprout very vigorously after a fire. Uh, it has that strong root system and can take advantage of the new growing space pretty quickly, whereas trees, um, if they're there, they may be able to sprout, but they also, the site might be in better shape and have better growing conditions, but until there's a seed source from above, there's no uh, seedlings to grow. And in the meantime, the mountain laurel can take over again. Uh, one positive to this dense growth pattern that mountain laurel has, especially on forest edges, which we have a lot of now in Pennsylvania, whether it's a road edge, pipeline edge, a well pad edge, um, a timber sale edge, whatever it might be, um, that dense growth tends to slow the spread of non-native invasive plants into the interior parts of the forest, uh, which is a great benefit to folks like myself who are trying to eradicate these non-native plants uh, or remove them from forest stands once they become established. So anytime I can see that mountain laurel is a strong competitor on the edge of a forest, I feel a little bit better that that forest is sort of safe or at least has a buffer uh, from some of these aggressive non-native plants. So here's what you all came for. How did mountain laurel become our state flower? Well, in 1927, there were some folks at Penn State that felt that tulip poplar and the flower of the tulip poplar tree should be our state tree and our state flower. Uh, if anybody knows this tree, it grows very quickly. It grows very straight. They're very tall, majestic, very unique leaves. You can see here that are shaped sort of in profile like a tulip. The flowers, uh, the way it gets its name, resemble tulip flowers. They're born at the very top of the tree. So unless you have a seed, um, you're not going to see the flowers until they fall off. So if you're walking around the woods in early spring, you often come upon uh, these giant flowers that have been uh, pruned by the squirrels from above or have knocked off in a windstorm. But you can't really see them if it's a mature tree. So, you know, this, this made it to Harrisburg. And, you know, as things tend to do, there was probably other priorities for the government. It wasn't trees and flowers uh, tend to not be the top priority. I know, big surprise. Um, so nothing really happened. A few years later, 1931, uh, new petition, Eastern Hemlock was officially named the state tree. Not a bad choice, um, but the flower kind of got forgotten. There was no longer a flower to go with this tree, um, so we're, we're kind of still in limbo. So then by 1933, there was uh, some more movement. And it came down to two species, our mountain laurel on the right and the azalea on the left. And there were apparently equal numbers of legislators who wanted azalea and those that wanted mountain laurel. And this was in the House and in the Senate. So both in our state house and our state Senate, two bills were passed that said the same thing except they had different species as the state flower. Uh, with the legislature in an impasse, as always, a forester has to step in and make the final decision when it comes to trees and plants. So luckily for us, uh, Gifford Pinchot happened to be the governor at the time. And if you know anything about Gifford Pinchot, I apologize for repeating it, but for those of you who don't know about Gifford Pinchot, uh, he started the United States Forest Service. He was one of uh, the United States' first official foresters in a government capacity. Uh, he was friends with Theodore Roosevelt uh, and, a, and a conservationist when uh, the conservation movement was just getting started. Uh, and really was one of those people that was at the nexus of politics and conservation and advocated very strongly that the United States 
couldn't uh, waste any more of its valuable natural resources. And instead, all the natural resources needed to be conserved and well managed, given that we would need to use them, uh, but we needed to find a way to do it carefully uh, and in a well thought out scientific way. So uh, he worked his way up through government. Eventually, he became the governor of Pennsylvania. So with great power comes great responsibility. And there in May of 1933, both bills were put on his desk, one for azalea being the state flower and one for Mount Laurel. To think that that was the hardest decision a governor had to make in 1933. Boy, those times were good. Um, but he preferred the azalea. Yeah. Unfortunately for him, perhaps, uh, his wife, Cornelia, preferred the Mount Laurel. So I, I can only imagine those conversations over <laughs> dinner. Um, but on May 5th, 1933, Mount Laurel was, uh, became the state flower, was signed into law uh, by Gifford Pinchot. And I just think it's very appropriate that a forester signs a bill into a law for our state flower, which happens to be a flower of our forests, not of our gardens or roadsides. No offense to Maryland and Black Eyed Susans. But unfortunately, we were Johnny come lately's because while we were trying to make decisions and arguing about it, uh, Connecticut had already chosen Mount Laurel in 1907. Thankfully, they're willing to share. So now that you know everything there is to know about the ecology of Mount Laurel, I know you're all asking, can you grow it at your house? And the answer is yes. And I suspect, like you, I, I, like, like me, you all have a vision of these uh, Mount Laurel lined driveways leading to your homes and offices. Uh, so how can we get there? How can we grow it at home? Well, before we talk about how we can grow it, we should take a minute and recognize this gentleman. His name is Richard Jaynes, and he is the reason that we have cultivated uh, variations of Mount Laurel to grow at our homes. So he worked for the Connecticut Department of Agriculture in the 60s. He retired and started his own nursery. All the while, he was working on trying to cultivate Mount Laurel. I'm not sure how you all, how much you all know about horticulture, and I'm an ecologist, not a horticulturalist, so this is gonna be a very dumbed down version. But generally, if there's a plant in the wild that you would like to be able to distribute or sell to people to grow around their homes, you have to collect a lot of different varieties. You collect ones that tolerate dry soil and wet soil ones that tolerate sun and shade, ones that are large, ones that are tall, ones that are sweet scented, ones that are brightly colored. And you try to find the variations that you think are gonna be one, most appealing to people, and two, uh, willing to tolerate the different sorts of habitats that we find around our homes versus natural settings. And for a long time, people struggled with Mount Laurel. Uh, they couldn't really get it to grow unless it was in a mature forest. Uh, some of the places like Jenkins Arboretum, you know, had the right habitat, had some uh, ericaceous species already growing there, and then they could build a collection around it. Uh, but the problem with a species like Mount Laurel is it, it benefits tremendously from uh, fungal associations, uh, mycorrhizal fungi that grow in forest soils that help distribute nutrients to the roots of the plants. And when someone would try to dig up and transplant one of these Mount Laurels, they would get a little bit of that fungi with whatever amount of soil they took, but probably when they transplanted it to their home, the soil chemistry and conditions weren't the same. And if the fungi couldn't survive, then the, the Mount Laurel probably didn't last too long either. So it took a lot of tinkering. And this gentleman uh, spent a lot of time working on this. And he, he found a variety that was smaller and more compact than what we see in the forest. He also found varieties that had a stronger band of color uh, in the middle of the flower. And he used those to develop the first cultivar, which was called Minuet. Uh, I found that it was first grown in 1978, and it was about another decade or so before there was enough of it grown to sell and distribute to other nurseries. 
So this gentleman is kind of the, the father of some of that uh, mountain laurel horticulture. And now, uh, according to one source I found, there's over 75 cultivated variations, which we call cultivars. Uh, so uh, when you think of a cultivar, there are varying degrees of tinkered with, so to speak. Um, if you grow a lot of mountain laurel and you really want a pink one and you grow 100 plants and two of them are pink, then you take those two pink ones and you cross pollinate them and grow those seeds. And some of those seeds will be even pinker. And if they are, then you grow more of those seeds and more and more. And then eventually you have a pink variety. So uh, this is something that's been done with plants for a very, very long time. And now with mountain laurel, we have all these different variations. We have some that are tall, some that are short stature. And you can see all different types of bloom colors, bloom patterns. You've got some with uh, a very wide band, uh, some with no band, some with just a very tiny bit of variegation right where those filaments touch the petals, um, and everything in between. So if you were to go to a garden center um, and you wanted to grow mountain laurel, they may have more than one of these varieties, or they may have the varieties that grow best in the place where you live. Uh, and that's something you can talk to the garden center folks about. But when it comes down to, am I planting a native plant, or am I planting something, a cultivated variation, uh, it depends on the plant as to how different they are. Um, and different could be in what we perceive, you know, characteristics like flower color and leaf shape and size, or it could be things that we can't really perceive as well, like ecosystem services. Does the cultivated variation produce the same quality nectar as the ones growing in the wild in the state forest? You know, so those are some things to think about. There's nothing wrong with cultivars and certainly planting mountain laurel cultivars, which are, you know, mountain laurel is a native species to Pennsylvania, is always gonna be better than planting something at your house that's not native to Pennsylvania or to the Eastern US. So anyway, what do you need to grow it? Uh, from what I can tell and reading some of the horticultural literature and sources that are out there, they tend to prefer kind of cool, moist soil, uh, well-drained. You know, you don't want soil that's gonna have standing water. Um, it doesn't really like clay soils, which makes sense because where it grows in the mountains and the ridges tends to be more rocky soil or loamy soil, uh, where clay soils is not really what I think of as mountain laurel territory. Acidic soils are best. As we talked about with the wild varieties, they uh, can grow in full sun, but prefer some shade. So, you know, if you've got a side of your house that gets a little bit of morning light, but then the sun kind of creeps around the rest of the house, that might be a good spot. If you have woods edges uh, or tree edges where you can plant the mountain laurel underneath a mature canopy, that's probably a good spot where it can just get some edge light. Um, if you have some places in a forest uh, that a deer are eating everything else, mountain laurel may be a good alternative because they're going to nibble it but probably not kill it. Uh, I also read that you don't want to plant the roots too deep, that you want to keep that root collar um, above the soil. Uh, some folks recommended a spring feeding of fertilizer that you can buy um, at garden centers for acid loving shrubs. To me, that sounds like a pretty good idea, especially if your soil is pretty rich where you live. Uh, and then they mentioned pruning it after the flowering is finished to help maintain a better shape and better vigor of the plant. Uh, and this is probably where I need to say, because I do work for DCNR and I am a company man, uh, don't remove any plants from the wild. Uh, we all love seeing Mount Laurel out in the forests of Pennsylvania, and it's best to leave those wild populations out there. There's plenty of great cultivars, as I just mentioned. I can't imagine they're super expensive. Um, use those, don't try to transplant plants from the wild. As I mentioned, the soil may not be conducive to the mycorrhizae that are needed for the mountain laurel, so it's probably gonna die anyway. Now, if you're walking in the woods and you want to trim some flowers for your sweetheart back home or for yourself, that's probably fine. You know, trimming off some of these flower heads is not gonna kill the plant. It's not gonna significantly impact uh, new growth the next year or how many seeds are gonna be out there. Um, so that would be something that you could do instead. 
And if you do clip mountain laurel flowers, either from your garden or from the wild, they do need to be in water right away. So they're not something that you can pick, put in your car seat, drive home, then get in water. You almost have to put them in your water bottle as you're walking if you wanna keep them till you get home. And they will keep in water for two or three days 